Can we actually trust in God to keep his promise to us? What makes you think he can for us if he didn't for Israel? Tribal trails, tribal trails. I'm glad to be able to once again to bring the word of God to you. And today it's going to be a subject probably many in the native churches especially have not heard of the subject called replacement theology. I don't claim to know everything about replacement theology, but enough to want to teach it to a native church so that it's something we don't have to correct, as it were, later. I think it's only right that we get teaching of things ahead of time rather than coming to the place where I've never heard of it. It's been given that name, replacement theology. Uh, it's a teaching that has come a long, long time ago. It's always been around till he got to the place now where the, it's, it, the whole thing is like the church, the born-again people. The church is not a building, windows, chimney in it and everything. But the church is the people. All right. Now, the Old Testament, you did have, in one place it says the church in the wilderness. It simply means the called out people who were traveling through the wilderness. That would be called out of Egypt, would be Israel. And the uh, the teaching is now that Israel had the covenants of, from God, some conditional, some unconditional. I'll explain that a bit later. And uh, they were chosen by the Lord. Abraham was the father of the nations. There's a lot of things we do not have the time to get into, but there's more of an introduction to something perhaps you have not read about, heard about, and I, I do think that you, we should know about. So we begin with Genesis 12. Uh, this is the way it begins. Verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless you. Curse him that curses you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now we usually call this the calling of Abraham the covenants with Abraham. Here, God is in, a, we'll call it, unconditional covenant. It's not dependent upon Abraham. If you do this for 100 years, and then if you live 175 years, and uh, then this, what we agree to today, will come to pass, will be. No, no. It didn't depend upon Abraham. It depended upon what God said in what we would call covenant or agreement, a contract, okay? Well, I think it would be just as well to call it an agreement because uh, God had told this and Abraham was blessed and he was glad that God had made him his chosen, him and his seed, uh, the chosen. Over in uh, chapter 15 of uh, Genesis, we have further to the covenant that God made with Abraham. This time, uh, it was made in the same way that nations or tribes, clans, or, you know, uh, different 
different people, maybe opposing each other on something, different uh, tribes, when they can come to agreement on something, they would make a, a, well, you can call it a peace treaty if you want to, but something that's done that recognizes that covenant or agreement. And uh, in this case, it was uh, a sacrifice. God told Abraham, okay, I'm going to give you a land. And I'm going to make this covenant with you that I'm going to give you a land that you and your descendants will live there. And uh, so Abraham then was told what to get. I'm just going to read it. And I think it'll help you. You probably read it before. A lot of you did. He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of your of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. Okay. The, you are, your, er, was down, way down south end, we'll say, of the Euphrates River. Way down there somewhere. There is this land, the Chaldeans, Abraham, well, I sometimes call him Abraham. He was, his name was changed later. Well, you probably catch me here calling him Abram or Abraham. I'm talking about the same person. And uh, he, God, had called him now, and he said, um, he said, Lord God, Abraham said, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And God said to him, okay, take you a heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. All these uh, birds or animal and animals were speci- specially for the sacrifice. And so the sacrifice was to be killed, and in this after that to be dressed, and in this particular case, okay was to be laid out on the ground in a certain way. It seems like uh, that while it was on the ground, there was to be a path in the middle. He was to cut up the, the, uh, the animals and lay the pieces out on this side and on this side and over there the idea, whole idea was that it was taken from something before that when these tribes out there uh, in their land would make agreement with each other. They would kill this to be the sacrifice, an animal. They would lay it out in pieces. And as they walk in between these pieces, we will keep this covenant. And I've read in another, another writing on this, we will keep this covenant. And if we don't keep this covenant, then may you be like this sacrifice, dead. However, in this particular sacrifice, <clears throat> there was not necessarily agreement made with Abraham. In other words, Abraham, if you do this, I'll do this. This was to be an unconditional covenant. God made the covenant. And as one writer put it, Abraham was half asleep when this happened. Well, we do read it in verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, God, said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation, it goes on, and then in uh, verse 16, fourth generation they shall come again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet f- full. Why is that? Well, the land that God was giving to Abraham was full of people. However, 
God had waited a long time. And he's going to wait yet another hundreds of years. He's waiting for them to turn. But nobody turned. God had given those people a chance. And they did not take it. So now that's replaced by the Israelites. We see from there that God will always have these people as his own inheritance. God's inheritance. These people, God's people, Abraham's seed. So the nation then of Israel did come through with bringing the scriptures into being and bringing the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be born of that nation. They don't recognize him as the Messiah. There will be a day when they will receive Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Now, when it came um, time here when Jesus came to the earth, he was God and man at the same time, and he was born to be the savior of the world. At about the age of 30, he started his ministry, and just that late uh, third year, uh, he was uh, crucified. And in crucifixion was the turning point, or I'll say the final rejection by the nation of Israel. Not the rejection by God of Israel. Remember, this is a unconditional sacrifice. And Israel did, is paying for their rejection of the Messiah. They are going through hard times. That same century, about 70 AD, they were scattered all over the world until just recently, 1948, and God brought them together again. Now, in this part, since they rejected the Messiah, God said that he would turn the gospel now to the Gentiles. The gospel has been preached to the nations, and many of them have come to know Jesus Christ, which makes up what we call the church. That is, the born-again people. And the church is uh, all over, a whole world. There are Christians everywhere. Not many in some places. But they're the ones now that God is dealing with. Don't misunderstand me. I am saying that God puts Israel aside for now. He didn't throw them away as the expression is in Cree, uh, in my language. But he put them aside. I have to put them aside. Uh, well, the door was open for any of them to come to Jesus Christ. Yes, there are a number of Christians from among them. And they're recognized now with the, all the born-again people who are known as the church. Now, the teaching has come lately that God has done away with Israel. In other words, you take something like sometimes I... I have a pen that won't work anymore. That is, I'm talking about me now. And I have a garbage can over here. And sometimes, if uh, sometimes good looking pen, but it does not work anymore, and I try to make it work, but it won't, I throw it away. Now that's thrown away. Now this could be a different thing altogether if I put this pen aside. I got another one here I can use. I'll put this aside. I'll pick it up later. Something like that. That God, uh, they say that teaching has come about in this way. That now all the promises that have been Israel are now, are now going to the church. The born again people. Israel doesn't count anymore. 
They're gone. They're dead. They're thrown away. I want to read three verses from the New Testament. <clears throat> and it's in the book of Romans, chapter 9, 10, and 11. I'm not going to read that many chapters, but just the first few verses of each in Romans chapter 9. All right. <clears throat> this is what it says. Paul said in verse 3, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Chapter 11. I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Those are Paul's words in the epistles that are inspired of God, that God is not through with Israel. True, they're not the main people he's dealing with. He is dealing with the church. However, when they say, all the promises that have been to Abraham's seed, Israelite, Jews, Hebrews, okay, are now gone to the church. That's not scriptural. That's not in the Bible to say that. Because God is going to redeem Israel again. He will. In time, he's going to. But think of what has happened. If God really did away with Israel, you know what it's, it means? It means that what God said to Israel in an emphatic way, in a real sincere way, he even made this uh, a covenant with him by means of sacrifice. The Bible tells us that God is going to redeem Israel. And what it means is, if he didn't, if he didn't keep his word and they gave the now to, to the church and uh, Israel is no more, what does it mean? That means God can renege or God can go back on his promises. The promises to Israel don't belong, uh, belong to the church? No. If he did that, consider it. You meet a friend, you made a deal on something and he didn't have enough money, he owed you $15. That ain't much. But after a while, he came to pay some of it, $5. That means he still owes you some. But after that, you didn't see this guy. He said he would, but he didn't. Uh, this person didn't come back to pay the rest of his debt, debt with you. Would you say he kept his word? No, he did keep his word. Okay. If God went back on any of his promises to Israel, covenants to Israel, if he went back, would you say that he kept his word? Can we as a church, as born-again Christians, people who have been chosen by God in this age, can we actually trust in God to keep his promise to us? What makes you think he can for us if he didn't for Israel? That's uh, a serious thought and an awful thought. If God could not keep his promise. Thank God. He is keeping his promise. He is going to come and get us. I know I've said this 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and so on. But I'm closer to it that he's coming for us. He's coming to get us. 
That's his word. He won't go back on it. Then, later on, we studied the prophecies here that he's going to come again after that to come and set up his kingdom for the nation of Israel and we will reign with him, the Bible says, for a thousand years. Now that replacement theology thing, it's just simply this, that God has done away with Israel. That's wrong. He didn't. God has given everything he was going to give to Israel. He gave to the church. That's wrong also. The two are chosen. Abraham and his seed, yes. And then it says in the book of Peter, Second Peter, you are a chosen people. We, the church, the born again people, chosen people. And he, what he says to us also, he will bring it to pass. God will keep his word. Don't forget that. Let's put it this way. How did we become church? Not just go to church. We are the church. Uh, It's simply that we trusted in Jesus Christ. I wasn't worthy. Neither were the other ones that are make up the church. You know what? If you are listening to me are not sure where you belong, you could belong to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, by simply trusting him, coming to him, praying to him to save you, forgive you of your sins, and tell him, thank you for dying for me. God bless you. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. You are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In my questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead You are the peace in my troubled sea. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. I won't hear what tomorrow brings, with each morning I'll rise and sing. My God's love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow. Bye.
just a promise. You will carry me.